thank you all for uh, finding your way here. We are halfway through the reign of Charles I. You've been thinking about it all week, haven't you? Charles I. He was uh, the son of James I in England. He's highly important for the development of events in the colonies, and so that's why we're taking a little extra time on him this morning and on his son, who is Charles II, that we're going to be covering briefly as well. So even though we're still focused a little bit on England, we really can't appreciate the colonies and what was going on there unless we have this in some degree of focus. So that's why I'm taking a little time on this. But uh, if you're interested, next, uh, two weeks, by the way, we don't meet next week, but two weeks hence, uh, we're going to be shifting pretty dramatically to the colonial history and leaving England and Scotland behind in some uh, measure, so that's uh, kind of the trail we're on here. But right now, you may recall last week we were talking about Charles I, who took over the throne. He wasn't quite as savvy as his father, James. He didn't know quite how to play the game with the Puritans, who had become quite influential. His uh, philosophy was just stamp them out, you know. He, he, uh, he didn't like their philosophy. He didn't like the, way, the fact that they wanted to limit the power of the king. He felt that his dad had been a little bit too weak in that department. And so when he summoned Parliament and they had some sense of his view of things, they weren't very cooperative. And because of that, of course, he was uh, deprived of the normal tax revenue that had to be authorized by Parliament. He was sustained through the years, basically from some tariffs that he collected and some revenue that came in from Catholic sources on the continent that were really pulling for him to do better. And uh, so he was able to maintain his monarchy there without Parliament, and that meant without constraint. And so he did launch a vigorous and vicious persecution against Puritans using as his main henchman a fellow by the name of Archbishop Laud, L-A-U-D. If you read our American Bill of Rights, you'll be astonished at how many of the, the rights that we have uh, uh, solemnized there trace back to abuses under Charles I and Archbishop Laud. The whole idea of the right to accuse, uh, the right to confront your accusers, the right to a jury of your peers, the right to counsel, the right to a trial in open court, and so on, all of those trace directly to that era of English history where all of those were violated dramatically. And these people remembered that, and they wanted to make sure we'd never revisit anything like that again. And so this is, uh, we, can, we can, in an ironic kind of way, we can thank, you know, the Archbishop for all of his abuses because we have really uh, been able to make sacred some of those uh, truths. Well, anyway, as you know, the campaign of Charles against England was also in parallel with one against the Scots. The Scots finally said enough of this. There was the Bishop's War, you recall, in which they essentially defeated Charles, threw off monarchy, and uh, that's where we were left it. So I want to pick up the story right there as we uh, proceed this morning. Our uh, text that we're going to be looking at, I've punched, there we go, here we go, uh, that we're going to be looking at and considering in connection with our present discussion is from the Apostle Paul, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I have a feeling this was a favorite text of some people who lived through some of the trauma that we're going to be describing in our present conversation. Paul describing his own experience and the experience of other Christians, of course, at that time, gives us these well-known words. He says, quote, uh, this, by the way, is uh, 2 Corinthians 4, beginning at verse 7, the Word of God. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus 
may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. So then death is working in us, but life in you. So keep that in your mind. We'll return to that briefly as we conclude. Let's uh, have a word of prayer and we'll get started. Our Father, we're grateful to you that you have mapped out such a drama in history and that we in many ways are the rich beneficiaries of the price that was paid by others of our brothers and sisters in Christ who've gone before. We pray that we would develop some healthy sense of appreciation for that and that we would be prepared in our own day to do those things you've called us to do in faithfulness to Christ, and we offer this prayer in his name. Amen. Okay, last week we shifted our focus from Scotland to England, and we talked about revolt and restoration. This is just where we left off. The revolt I have in mind here is called the Puritan Revolt in England. The restoration is the restoration of monarchy in England. So that's the general context for what we're describing. Charles I, we mentioned a moment ago, um, is uh, the king that is really largely responsible for what we're talking about here. And as we mentioned a moment ago, he lost the bishop's wars. Now, that happened because he summoned Parliament, hoping Parliament was going to give him revenue to raise a credible army to meet the Scots who were rebelling against his rule because of the way in which he had been attacking and persecuting them. That Parliament is called the Short Parliament. It met in the summer of 1640 in London. It lasted a couple of weeks, and then they all went home because uh, at this point, Charles learned that this parliament now had been through 11 years of abuses, courtesy of Archbishop Laud, they were in no mood to do any favors for Charles I. And he realized he was dealing basically with a lion's den here. And so he said, okay, you guys go home. He didn't really have a plan B, but at this point he had no resources at his disposal. And that's part of the reason the Bishop's War was won so handily by the Scots, even though they didn't have much in the way of weaponry. Well, after the short parliament, the long parliament convened. The Long Parliament is called the Long Parliament because it lasted for 20 years, unprecedented, before or since, a 20-year sustained gathering of Parliament in England, you see. Parliament gathered on its own initiative. Usually the king would summon Parliament, but at this point the Parliament said, enough of this, we're going to gather on our own initiative and one of the first items of business that was considered by the Long Parliament was whether or not Charles should remain the king. Given the abuses for which he was responsible, all of the violations of due process, all of the insults and injuries that they had sustained all through the years, they were really not so prepared to grant that he had a right to continue to be their king. And so they were basically contemplating deposing him. He knew that, and he went into hiding. So Charles found a uh, flat somewhere in downtown London where he was hiding out, and he began to try to figure out how he could muster an army to meet what was probably going to be a civil war that he sensed was probably going to be breaking out in the near future. Well, where's this army going to come from by which he's going to meet not a Scottish resistance, but an English resistance to his rule? He did have loyalists in England and in uh, the surrounding areas that were willing to rally to his support. There were loyalists, there were monarchists. Not everybody was a Puritan, believe it or not, at that point. Some people were really prepared to buy off on a proposition of, of uh, supporting him. He also appealed to Ireland. Ireland was willing to give him a fair amount of support in the form of uh, troops and so on. It was basically Catholic. There was a Scottish enclave there, but largely Catholic. They supported him. Charles was uh, broadly viewed as very sympathetic to the Catholic Church. Probably privately he was a Catholic. He was married to a Catholic princess. And so they were willing to support him. It may surprise you to hear that Charles also appealed to Scotland, that it just defeated him. 
in the Bishop's War, you know, and that does seem a little bit unexpected, you know, what in the world would the Scots be interested in helping out Charles? But Charles said essentially to the Scots, okay, everybody, I'm sorry, I messed up, I made a mistake. If you guys will come and bail me out, help me supply, you know, some, some forces and revenue and so on to fight this battle, I promise you, you will have your Presbyterian church, you'll have your religious liberties, I'm not going to bother you anymore. That was the promise he made. This is probably one of the most fatal mistakes the Scots ever made. They believed him, you know. Uh, but they were so cherishing the prospect of religious freedom that they, oddly enough, came into this battle on the wrong team. I mean, from our point of view, I guess, you'll have to make your own judgment there, but one way or another, they came in supporting Charles. So that was an army that was being gathered over several months. It takes time, of course, and all this time Charles was, was being kept uh, uh, under wraps. Uh, they didn't know quite where he was. He was able to hide out at that point time for that uh, purpose. Meantime, Parliament was also assembling an army. The person that they chose to lead this army was a fellow by the name of Oliver Cromwell. He had already distinguished himself in British uh, military and political life. He was well known. He was known to be a thoroughgoing and committed uh, Calvinist Puritan, and he seemed like the right guy for the job, both by his essential theological outlook and also because of his uh, conspicuous experience. Under him was formed what was called in England the New Model Army. It was a new model for England that was going to be hopefully the result of a civil war that was at this point brewing. Remember that in the colonies there was the Massachusetts Bay Colony. It had been established in 1632. We're only eight years down the road now. So 1640, the Massachusetts Bay people have really hardly just you know, gotten a lot of traction yet. They're still making their way, kind of building their houses and, and so on, but they haven't really become an established colony, we might say, on a long-term basis. They knew that their destiny hung in the balance. If, in fact, there was going to be a civil war in England, then the welfare of Massachusetts Bay and the Plymouth Colony as well was really hanging by a thread. And so many of those who were in Massachusetts Bay got on boats and ships and went back to England and signed on to the new model army there in England, hoping to usher in Puritan rule in England, which would not only secure a future for England in their view, but also, of course, for Massachusetts Bay. So about 20,000 people stayed behind. Those who were fighting men went over back to England. Those who stayed behind in Massachusetts were praying and hoping uh, for the best, and this was a time of some degree of uh, concern for them. So uh, what does that give us? I'm sorry, I'm, these two operate independently, and there we are. Uh, that brings us now to the uh, Civil War. English Civil War. It finally erupted with open armed conflict in 1642. It lasted until 1649. I'm sorry, 1645. It was about a three or four year uh, uh, civil war in England. The only true civil war that's ever happened in the history of England was during these years. Uh, it represented certain military skirmishes here and there. I think it's safe to say that uh, basically the war was fought indecisively. Sometimes the forces on Charles' side seemed to get the upper hand. Sometimes the forces of the New Model Army seemed to do better. Uh, essentially, Cromwell's army uh, was, uh, was certainly holding its own. They were getting, both sides were getting some help from outside. One of the interesting things about the new model army that's noted in historical sources at the time was how well behaved the army was. We can be, whatever your politics are, we can be proud of these people because this army did behave something like Christians, you know. Usually military men in the throes of battle, knowing that they're going to be facing some kind of life-threatening situation in the next day or two, sometimes their behavior can be a little bit sketchy. Uh, 
and they can be known for somewhat hard living types of behavior, you know that. So you'll have uh, commonly a lot of uh, sometimes gambling and cursing and uh, loose morals and that sort of thing. And the New Model Army really distinguished themselves to everybody's satisfaction that you didn't see much of that going on. Uh, last week I mentioned Thomas B. Macaulay, who wrote a multi-volume History of England, volume one, page 119. He delineates some of the ways in which the new model army, army distinguished itself for its Christian conduct, including uh, saying this, this is uh, uh, from that page, uh, quote, no servant girl complained of the rough gallantry of the red coats. Not an ounce of plate was taken from the shops of the goldsmiths and so on. He gives quite a list of uh, various ways in which this army tended to distinguish itself. One other interesting development during this civil war was in 1644, Samuel Rutherford wrote and published a work entitled Lex Rex. He thought that is what is up for grabs. That is what this civil war is about. It's the question, is it Rex Lex? The king is the law? What the king does is right just because he does it? Is that the proper way to run a government? Or is it lex rex? The law is the king. And even the king is subservient to the law. And therefore there is a stability here that doesn't depend on the whims of the current monarch. That of course was the Calvinistic idea, strongly committed to a notion that ultimately the law is the king and the rules that give rise to particular laws arise out of the consent of the governed. And so Samuel Rutherford, a Presbyterian, Scottish philosopher, theologian, produced this book right in the middle of this civil war, arguing for the legitimacy of the position that is being uh, basically fought for by the New Model Army. So they continued to war until June 14, 1645. A decisive battle that took place at Nasby in England was clearly a victory and kind of a decisive final victory for the New Model Army. Charles himself was captured. He was incarcerated awaiting trial. And so we have then a period of some 15 years in which England is ruled by Parliament. So the long Parliament that was convened in 1640 continues to rule until 1660. And the first thing this Parliament did was offer to Oliver Cromwell to be the king. And Cromwell said, what part of no more monarchy don't you people get, you know? Uh, he, was, uh, he was appalled at the thought. He believed the very thing he had fought for was to be free from this and to have a truly, uh, you might say, constitutional republic. It was very undeveloped. It was nothing like what eventually would develop in America, but he viewed that as their task. And that's what they would fought for and that's what they should be attempting to accomplish. But uh, Cromwell declined that offer, but Cromwell did have some unfinished business he needed to care for. Uh, first of all, what to do with Scotland. Having won the Civil War, of course, also meant that he now, as kind of spoils of victory, was also uh, basically uh, put in a position of dealing with uh, affairs in Scotland. Scotland had bet on the wrong horse. Uh, what's going to happen? The Scottish people were a little nervous. They shared a common theology a common philosophy with Oliver Cromwell, but their politics, you know, had been uh, somewhat uh, inconsistent. Cromwell treated the Scots pretty well. He did occupy Scotland at this point, so there was an English occupation army there for a while. However, because he, uh, he appreciated their theological views, he was fundamentally of the very same view himself, he treated them rather benignly, he allowed them complete religious freedom and a great deal of political freedom. And so we'd say that basically in Scotland, even though they had been on the losing team, uh, Cromwell treated them pretty well. Uh, the Scots themselves seem to have learned their lesson. Uh, they really doubled down on their commitment not to support kings anymore. Uh, we hear, for example, in uh, 1649, 
uh, a few years into this period of time. This is from Scott Seifert. So the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland resolved in 1649 that, quote, arbitrary government and unlimited power are the foundations of all corruptions in church and state, and boundless and unlimited power is to be acknowledged in no king or magistrate, you see. Uh, so they kind of uh, basically uh, give testimony here to the fact that they had made an error back there and, and they wouldn't do it again. So for whatever that's worth, that was kind of the outcome there. Now on the other hand, uh, when we think about Ireland, we have a somewhat different story. Ireland uh, had a Scottish uh, presence there, but by far most of those in Ireland were still loyal to the Catholic Church. Uh, if there's any black eye in the history of Oliver Cromwell, it's his treatment of Ireland. He was brutal, probably inexcusably so. Uh, he punished them way beyond anything that was probably legitimate given the circumstances. We can understand he was uh, somewhat bitterly disposed toward them. Uh, but I would say his behavior in Ireland certainly qualifies as sub-Christian. And to this day, if you visit Ireland, you're going to find that Oliver Cromwell is not viewed favorably. Uh, they remember that like it was last week. And so that's an unfortunate thing. And I just have to give you that in the spirit of honesty, that at least at that point, uh, we're not so proud of Oliver Cromwell. Uh, there was a trial that was conducted in England. Uh, after a couple of years of preparation, Charles I was was uh, tried on the allegation that he had committed treason. His treatment of the Puritans and others back under Archbishop Laud, the abuses, the mutilations, the executions, the private trials, Star Chamber, you name it, they did it. All of it was viewed as highly inconsistent with any form of kind of fair jurisprudence, not to mention what had happened in Scotland, all of that was viewed as legitimate to charge him and convict him of the, of the crime of treason. And for that, he was executed uh, in, on June, uh, January 30th of 1649. This was viewed negatively by the nations of Europe. Even though they may have agreed, some of them, with the outcome of the trial, they really didn't agree with execution. Regicide, of course, is viewed as a very... Uh, rare and probably unjustifiable thing from their point of view at that time. Uh, so that didn't score them many points, but one way or another, that was uh, the outcome. The other thing that happened in the same year, for which we're a little bit uh, more favorably disposed, is that the Westminster Confession of Faith was finally published. Uh, the Westminster Assembly had been authorized by the Parliament, the Long Parliament in England. It was now to produce an English language confessional statement which would be a representation of the views of the English Puritans, Congregationalists, the Scottish Presbyterians who participated in this as well, and the product of that couple of years of effort was what we call the Westminster Confession. It is a brilliant and wonderful, trenchant, thoroughly Calvinistic expression of the Reformation uh, tradition going back especially to that thinker. On a personal note, I'll just mention to you, uh, I joined this church in 1980. Uh, I was just a fresh, brand new, off the turnip truck, truck uh, Presbyterian, you know? Uh, I have a whole history there that I won't bother you with right now, but I, I wanted to be a Presbyterian. I talked myself into that teaching church history over the last several years before then, and so uh, here I was. Now, I grew up Baptist, and Baptists don't think much of creeds and confessions. They always say it's the Bible, and I agree with that, you know. But it led me to have a somewhat disparaging view of confessional statements, you know what I'm saying? Like they're kind of evil. Oh, those creeds and confessions. That was kind of the atmosphere that I was reared in, and so I was still in my head, even in 1980 when I joined a Presbyterian church. But I had taught church history long enough to know that that Westminster Confession must have been something special. And so uh, I sat down and read it at some point along the way, and I was just stunned, saying, in effect, to this written piece of literature, where have you been all my life? You know, it was, it was most, uh, just a wonderful experience of reading such a, such a well-crafted delineation of the Reformed theology uh, going back to the Reformation itself. I framed a thought in my mind about 1982 or so that I wanted to teach this 
1984, the fall, the first class I ever taught in the adult ed program at First Presbyterian Church was the Westminster Confession. I didn't think anyone would come because Dale Bruner was in the sanctuary, standing about where I am right now, and who's going to go to hear some you know, young guy named Gore when you've got Dale Bruner, you know, right here. But I was so happy, a few intrepid souls showed up, and uh, for three years we worked our way through the uh, Westminster End. It's, it was, uh, to this day, it's a wonderful memory. Uh, so I have this personal affinity, I just had to mention that, uh, as we pass by it now in this narrative. In any event, uh, those people who had come from Massachusetts Bay and come over and fought under Cromwell uh, stayed on, many of them, some went home, many stayed, and continued to participate in the government that was being arranged here. Cromwell in Massachusetts Bay was celebrated as a hero. He had rock star status, as you can imagine. And uh, so really, uh, this was uh, viewed as the dawning of a great day, as the, as the Puritans were uh, in control. And many people thought that this is it, you know, finally. We're almost like we're ushering in the millennium here. This is a, a great opportunity for uh, this new development to take place in England. Well, some things happened. Uh, which re led us eventually to what's called the Restoration. Uh, it's a complicated period. I think to simplify it, probably overly simplify it, a couple of things can be mentioned. Probably these who were the Puritans in control of Parliament were wanting too much too fast. Kind of like Edward VI the previous century had been pushing too hard, and the English people were not all on board with this. They probably would have moved generally slowly, gradually in the right direction. But the rule here was a little bit forceful and it bred a certain degree of resentment. This Puritan parliament couldn't simply dictate to everybody, this is what you now need to believe and think and so on. As you can imagine, uh, it was complicated. And the complication was uh, added to even more because the Puritans, though they themselves uh, were pretty solid, you see, in their view and so on. Uh, they, they were balanced, and, and uh, I think we can uh, see that from their writings and preaching and so on. Nevertheless, there were fringe groups that began to pop up during this period of time. You've heard of the lunatic fringe? Well, that's what was going on. You had some real goofy people that were sort of coming up, not in the mainstream of Puritanism, but on its edges. And these people were radical in many ways, and they had odd names like the Levelers and the Diggers, and one group called itself the Fifth Monarchy Men. And they believed that the Puritan revolt that had been successful was actually going to usher in the return right now, right here, of Jesus. He's going to return and establish a great kingdom on earth and rule from London. Over the, you know, and they were teaching this stuff, and people were you know, following them to some degree. And others were going, whoa, what is this? You know how that happens? Every time you have these major movements in history, you're always going to get these fringy types that come along and cause problems. L Luther had what were called the radical reformers, uh, the Zwickau prophets, they were called, uh, some forms of Anabaptistry and so on popped up and gave him grief. He, got, he actually got more upset sometime with them than with the Catholic Church, and that was pretty hard for Luther, you see. John Calvin uh, had to deal with the Libertines in Geneva, who took doctrines of justification by faith and predestination to absurd extremes, justifying immorality of the most extreme form and so on. Uh, you know how that is. You know, I don't know. Um, who you voted for in the last election. I'm not going to be political here, but I'm just going to mention to you that uh, depending on who you voted for, uh, you know, if you voted one way, you've probably heard voices say that you're some kind of Marxist or communist or atheist and you hate America. But if you voted a different way, you've been called a white supremacist and you've been called a, a, you know, an insurrectionist and a racist. And we go, wait a minute, where's the public square? You know, that kind of name calling, judging a whole group by some lunatic fringe, doesn't really facilitate conversation, does it? And that's what happened in England. Uh, this kind of lunatic fringe began to be the terms by which all of the conversation was defined. And pretty soon you didn't have a public square anymore. You just, you just had a whole lot of uh, kind of a polarization, you know. And that was really what took place. And uh, 
to make matters worse and to kind of cap it all off, um, Oliver Cromwell died in 1658. Not, not clear what the causes were. There's some stated causes, but many people think it was just the absolute grief of trying to... Ma he could fight a war fine, but dealing with the impossible political entanglements that were beginning to arise increasingly uh, in England was giving him uh, such grief that, uh, you know, it just kind of ground him down and there were other causes and so on. Uh, so he's dead. 1658, what to do? Well, as a matter of habit, the English, the Parliament, offered rule to his son. Now, Oliver probably wouldn't have even sanctioned that, but that was kind of the habit they were in. You have a leader, and when he dies, you know, control goes to the son. In this case, it was a huge, huge mistake because this son mismanaged everything. He was kind of a narcissist. He had no wisdom. He didn't have a fraction of the competence of his father. And in two years, he made a bad situation unspeakably worse. So that by the end of this period of time, the, uh, the, the tide had turned against the Puritans. Uh, control of Parliament had really turned against the Puritans. And in, in 1660, uh, an offer was made by the Parliament to restore the son of Charles I, Charles II, to the throne there in England. Well, Charles II comes in, and he has a whole lot of reasons to be very unhappy, you know? So if, uh, um, if Charles I had been, uh, this was kind of like when Rehoboam followed Solomon. You remember that story? And Rehoboam was, was told, look, if you lighten up on the people, they'll treat you well but if you're hard on them, they won't. And Charles kind of came in with the same sort of view. Uh, you know, that, that whatever his dad was, had done, he was going to do more of it and, and more severely. Uh, these were the people he felt that had executed his dad. He hadn't forgiven anybody for that. Uh, he also felt he'd come in with a mandate. And the mandate that he'd been invited back was kind of going to give him sort of a carte blanche here. Uh, to do what he wanted, and that's exactly what he did. So the story uh, takes place beginning with what took place in England. So we're going to talk about that and then Scotland as well. Charles II comes in. He reverses carte blanche across the board all of these pro-Puritan policies with harsh, brutal persecutions, not only of Puritans, Presbyterians, Congregationalists, Bap Reformed Baptists who were then a movement in England and others. Anybody associated in any way with the Protestant tradition became the target of brutal uh, persecution, even exceeding, you might say, what had taken place back under his dad. This, by the way, is that period of time in which um, John um, Pilgrim's Progress, John Bunyan, uh, was, uh, was alive and preaching, you may recall that. He was in prison when he wrote Pilgrim's Progress, the most famous uh, allegory of uh, Christian history. Uh, but it was during this period of time. He had, he had, by the way, served in the New Model Army, but now, of course, he became persona non grata there in England. Uh, the colonists who had been serving under Oliver Cromwell sort of quietly tried to go back across the, uh, the ocean and uh, take up their home back in Massachusetts Bay. Uh, Massachusetts Bay was hoping that they were going to escape some of the brutality of, of uh, Charles, but it wasn't really the case. Royal power was reimposed in Massachusetts Bay in 1664. By 1685, the charter upon which the Massachusetts Bay colony had been formed was vacated. Now this is important because we don't tend to appreciate Massachusetts Bay was not kind of an unbroken stream of good, solid Puritan life. You know, they, they dealt with a whole lot of uh, brutal treatment, really, from England. And many people began to waffle a little bit under the pressures, the fires. This is now the second generation. And so Massachusetts Bay, if I can just put it, you know, politely, began to see a little bit of slippage uh, in the sharp edge of their commitments. 
Uh, Oliver Cromwell had been a rock star, now you don't even mention him in polite company. You know, all of these things are beginning to change. The sharp edge of a Puritan vision, a city on a hill, and so on. It began to get a little bit murky as they were just dealing with this very harsh kind of response, uh, largely coming from Charles. So that's what's going on. So far we have England undergoing this rather brutal treatment, Massachusetts Bay kind of slipping a little bit, you see, uh, and it's only going to get worse over the next uh, several years. We're gonna trace that more in a week or two to come, but uh, we'll leave it there. And I wanna shift now to Scotland, what happened in Scotland. The years from 1660 to 1680 are commonly called in Scottish history, the killing times. And if you go to a Scot to this day and mention, if they know anything about their history, the killing times, they will tell you, well, it was back there under Charles II, about 1660 and following. That's when it happened. That's the name that's been applied to it in, uh, in uh, Scottish history. Uh, the Scots, have so, of course, realized that the advent of Charles II could pose a ticklish problem for them. They reminded Charles that they had fought for his father in that civil war. That should score them some points. They were the first to recognize Charles II when he came and took the throne in 1660. But in spite of all of that, Charles was unmoved. These people were Presbyterians, and that was just as bad, maybe worse, than being Puritans. And so he launched an all-out campaign against the Presbyterians in Scotland that was probably worse than what he was doing in England. He enacted all kinds of laws which were intended to basically dismantle the Presbyterian Church in Scotland. The Five Mile Act uh, was enacted in 1665. Uh, Scott Seifert says the English struck back hard enacting the Five Mile Act, 1665, which banned Covenanter ministers from coming within five miles of their former churches. Covenanters, you remember the National Covenant that inspired the Bishop's War some years earlier, the Covenant was still there. But now ministers in those Covenant churches were banned from coming within five miles of their churches. So they held services and meetings called conventicles out in the forest, uh, hiding, you see, kind of under cover of darkness and so on, continuing to worship together. But uh, he continues, these illegal services were hunted down, men were hanged, women were drowned. There was brutal persecution of uh, Scots people at that time under Charles II. Some years back, I did a series on church history. I'll go into quite a bit more detail on this there. So I'm just kind of touching on it. It was not a pretty picture. It was a time when these Scottish Presbyterians were now facing the wrath of the English throne, and there was nothing to constrain this king as he was going out. So this brutal persecution, of course, caused many of the Scots to flee. Uh, again, we hear uh, from Scott Cipher, to show allegiance to the covenant was high treason. During a period known as the killing time, covenanters were hunted down like rabbits, butchered in ghastly ways. Those who survived first fled to Ireland, then during the mass Scots-Irish immigration to America. So this is important for our story. Uh, Charles goes after the English, and in a sense it has a dampening effect, a kind of chilling effect in Massachusetts Bay. But there's another population of Presbyterians now that are being driven out, first to Ireland, eventually to America, and they also are going to become an important role, and that's us, you see. These are the Presbyterians that we're really telling the story of in uh, what's uh, you know, basically uh, part of the content of this whole series. Others uh, stayed in Scotland. They became kind of an underground, something like the French Resistance, in the Second World War, this was the Scottish resistance. And so these people, in spite of the persecution, met in secret meetings. They plotted how in the world they could rise up and sort of defend themselves against the harsh treatment that was being brought against them. This all culminated in 1680 in what was called the Covenanter Revolt. It was hopefully going to be another bishop's war from 40 years earlier. Didn't turn out that way, but that was the hope. In any event, the Scots rallied 
behind a man whose name was Richard Cameron. He was commonly called the Lion of the Covenant, famous fellow in Scots history. Uh, he was the notable leader of this kind of resistance movement. He was assembling an armed force against much more powerful now uh, forces that were being brought by Charles II. Uh, the founder was Richard Cameron, who in 1680 led a breakaway movement in Scotland for independence, but he was killed soon thereafter. His failed religion grew in majesty and romance. He became a kind of cult hero after his death. Uh, probably a lot more was accomplished after, Richard, uh, after uh, he died, Richard Cameron died, than even during his life uh, because of the circumstances of his life and death. His failed religion grew in majesty and romance. The followers of his anti-English Presbyterianism referred to themselves as Cameronians. So remember that word because the, the Presbyterians in the colonies would often call themselves Cameronians. And they were tracing themselves back to this Lion of the Covenant back there in Scottish history, uh, continuing their war against uh, English rule. So he became a national hero. Uh, the Lion of the Covenant, uh, the, the great battle that he fought against the English, uh, the battle in which he died, uh, the day before that battle, he preached a sermon. He was originally a pastor, a covenanter pastor there in Scotland. He preached a sermon that was so optimistic, you would think he felt that he had the victory, uh, you know, in, in the palm of his hand for what would happen the next day. He said in the sermon, quote, we are of the opinion that the church shall yet be more high and glorious and the church shall have more power than she ever had before. Uh, then he went into battle the next day and was killed in battle along with many, many of those who went into battle with him. You would have thought that would have been a huge negative blow and certainly it was to this Scottish movement, but the well-known Puritan theologian and divine in England, shortly after the death of Richard Cameron, preached a sermon in which he said, quote, though our persons fall, our cause shall be as truly, certainly, and infallibly victorious as that Christ sits on the right hand of God. The gospel shall be victorious. This greatly comforts and refreshes me. The point I'm making here is that even though these are brutal times, uh, that Puritan optimism didn't go away. Some people, you know, were dealing with crushing circumstances in life, and yet there was still this kind of deep conviction that God was at work and that he was going to do something good in these people's lives eventually. So the covenanters were defeated there. That seemed to be the end of that covenanter movement, but even then they weren't quite destroyed. All right, now I want to throw in, uh, in the last couple of minutes here, a little detail that uh, becomes critically important for our discussion of the colonies, which we'll be picking up next time we're together. Charles II needs money, you know, he's, he's, it's expensive. Uh, persecuting people costs money. Mounting a big army costs money. Uh, soldiers want to be paid, you need money. And so he's trying to come up with every conceivable device he can to generate more revenue besides just taxing the people into oblivion. You know, that's a delicate balance there. And so he came up with an idea. This is 1663. So three years into his reign, he knows that he's got Massachusetts Bay on the north, which he's basically taking over. He's got Jamestown on the south. He's got a big tract in the middle. And he thinks to himself, you know, I bet there's gold in them there hills. I bet that if I could get some people there to develop that land, it would be a great revenue source. This was one of many strategies he had. And so he mapped out uh, this vast region there and called it Carolina. You ever heard of that? Carolina. It was named for Charles, you know. Uh, Carolina. Uh, eventually became North and South Carolina. But at this point, it's just this big tract of land right in the middle. That's the origins of that name and the origins of that uh, history. Uh, well, what to do? He's not going to go over and run it himself. So he gives control of this uh, 
Uh, you might say virtually ownership. It had a few caveats there, but basically the ownership, at least in, in trust, to some British nobles who were called Lords Proprietors. And they would, earn, they would own it in perpetuity as long as they would live by the charter that Charles gave to them. And so the Lords Proprietors Uh, take over this land, their job is to turn it into a money machine for Charles. Well, how do you do that? You need people. And so the Lord's proprietors began advertising, trying to get people to go to Carolina. And to, they they would be given land, and the land would be theirs in perpetuity, and they'd farm it and so on, and that would become a profitable uh, venture. Well, what was the appeal that would cause people to leave their home and go to Carolina? For a lot of, uh, for the non-Puritan English, there was no great incentive, you know, to go across the ocean, but for the Puritans there was uh, some degree of incentive, and also for the Scots in the north. The first advertising appeal, and this, by the way, is language taken from a brochure, an advertising brochure, published by the Lord's Proprietors in England and Scotland in 1666. And the first appeal was, if you go there, you will have complete, unadulterated religious freedom, you know. So the actual brochure, the language was this, quote, there is full and free liberty of conscience granted to all so that no man is to be molested or called in question for matters of religious concern but everyone to be obedient to the civil government, worship God after their own way. Now that had some considerable appeal to people who were facing religious persecution and seeing it getting worse and worse day by day, and quite a few people began to take an interest in heading for the New World and that region called Carolina. The second incentive that was included in this brochure was that it'd be economic opportunity. The colonies, as they were at that time, of course, had no caste system. They didn't have nobility or common. None of that was going on. There was a lot of social fluidity. Uh, Seifert says as Europe was rigidly divided by classes and mobility, it was rare. In the colonies, the classes were vastly more fluid and the possibility to own land vastly more likely than it would be in Europe. And so what happened? Many of these fiercely independent Scott Presbyterians saw the appeal of religious freedom, saw the opportunity to get out from under the, uh, really the reign of terror that they felt that they were experiencing, and in fairly large numbers you began to see them coming across the ocean and settling in Carolina. So our story of the Presbyterians is going to have a lot to do with Carolina. And we're going to be mentioning that more than once. So I just wanted you to know where that came from and how come it became such an appealing prospect to these people who eventually came over. Well, Charles II died in 1685. Uh, This was after Richard Cameron had been defeated in battle, killed five years earlier. Uh, This was a moment in which it seemed as if there was going to be now Sorry, I'm, there we are. Uh, It was going to be uh, maybe a little bit of a breath of fresh air. The Covenanters uh, were once again beginning to do a little bit of, you know, kind of coming up for air, hoping that maybe under James, they would have a little bit more opportunity. Uh, But as it turns out, James appeared to be turning out to be about, about as bad as his father. Uh, In 1685, the English Lord Chancellor declared in response to these rising forces in Scotland, uh, we have a new sect sprung up among us from the dunghill, referring to the Presbyterians, the very dregs of the people who killed by pretended inspiration, whose idol is that accursed paper, the covenant. And so it looked as if now under James II, uh, things were going to be as bad as they had been under James, the, uh, under Charles II. Something astonishing happened, uh, and I'm going to leave you with this now, but uh, the English people are basically good people. You know, they're good people. I say this to any English person that may eventually listen to this. They are good people, and they'd had it up to here with both sides of this deal. 
The Puritans were a little bit too rigid for them, and they didn't quite countenance that, but Charles was just inexcusable. And the thought that James was going to come in and continue this, what amounted to a, an illegitimate reign of terror against English people and Scottish people, was too much. And after three years, it precipitated uh, an invitation to a man whose name was um, uh, William, William of Orange, who is the king, or not a king, but a prince in Holland. William of Orange came in, William and Mary, in 1688. It's commonly called in English history the Glorious Revolution, or sometimes called the Bloodless Revolution, because he comes in without a shot being fired. He was, in fact, invited uh, into England to take over this mess. And William and Mary appeared. James II was deposed. Nobody protested in his favor. He was uh, shipped out. He wasn't executed, but he was sent into exile. And this represented kind of a, a benchmark in English history. Um, you know that the English monarchy has, has uh, existed to this day. Uh, but of course, what we would call it now is a constitutional monarchy. In England, uh, conspicuously, the ruler is bound by law. And in fact, as time has gone on, of course, the ruler has become virtually a figurehead. No political power to speak of, but kind of a, 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 a sort of a rubber stamp, you see, for the actions of the prime minister and, and the parliament and so on. When did that all happen? When was that transformation? It was really 1688. So this was the revolutionary moment, and from this point on, you would say that England was on a somewhat different trajectory than it had ever been before. Enough of absolute monarchy, enough of rex lex, enough of that kind of tyranny of an un out of control ruler, we're going to do it a different way. And so the Puritans actually had their, uh, won their day, it just took a while, even in England. It's not quite the Puritan government, but it was certainly driven by uh, some Puritan values. So I conclude here uh, with this, that the Puritan vision of constitutional monarchy was finally and permanently realized in England. All right, almost done, got 60 seconds. Uh, the verse we had at the very beginning was, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always caring about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our body. So, just some thoughts here as we wrap up. One, God has ordained that the kingdom of Christ will grow in a drama that includes being hard-pressed, perplexed, persecuted, struck down. I, don't, I wouldn't do it that way, you see. I would say the kingdom grows by sweetness and light, Sunday school picnics, lovely times on the beach. That's what I would be. But Jesus has ordained that it's going to be a bumpy road on many occasions. And sometimes as we as Christian people try to live out a life of faithfulness at various times in history, various cultural circumstances, we can feel that we're being hard-pressed, perplexed, persecuted, struck down. But God has nevertheless promised that even when we are hard-pressed, we will never be crushed. Even when we are perplexed and confused, we will never be despairing. When we are persecuted, we will not be forsaken. And when we are struck down, we will not be destroyed. That's really good news. Uh, I hope you appreciate the fact that even when we are put through tests, which we are from time to time, uh, God is faithful and watching over us in that struggle. So God is determined in this way that the death of the Lord Jesus reflected in our suffering will display the glory of his resurrection in our witness to his rule. These people that we're hearing about here are uh, great you know, examples of, uh, I think, in incorporating that into their thought and into their lives, and I hope that uh, our thoughts about them are inspiring and encouraging to you.
and I'm done, except if you, if you need to leave, you can, but uh, you know, if you have any comments or questions or thoughts you'd like to uh, throw out there, I'd love to hear them. In a way that it survives to yes, today. yes, good point. The, uh, the, the 1688 revolution did in fact affirm the Anglican Church, but a much more benign Anglican Church. No more Archbishop Lauds, no more star chambers, you know, no more of that kind of brutal abuse of dissenters. Uh, William, William and Mary really brought in what we would call religious tolerance. So the established official church in England was the Anglican Church, but if you were a nonconformist, congregational, something else, that's fine. We're not going to, you know, harry you from pillar to post. So you're right. But there was still a, a considerable difference in the Yes, especially um, uh, when we deal with uh, George Whitfield, who, in terms of one human being responsible for kind of galvanizing a sense of being an American rather than being a Virginian or a New Yorker, uh, it's Whitfield, who was an Anglican priest to the day he died and was universally hated in America by the Anglicans, the Episcopals and was universally loved by what are called the New Side Presbyterians, you know. Uh, it's an extremely interesting story, and so in that connection we'll have to deal rather um, at some detail with the Episcopalians. Yeah. Good. Anybody else? Yeah. Thank you all. So next, week. next week we do not meet, okay? We're going to be in here singing songs with gusto. And then two weeks out, we'll be picking up, and we'll really be shifting now to the uh, American side of this conversation. Let's, uh, let's pray, and then we'll be dismissed. Our Father, we're grateful for these who have gone before. We thank you for the testimony that they've left for us, inspiring stories of courage in the face of very difficult challenges. We pray that we would be inspired by these to whatever God has called us to do at this moment that we would be your faithful servants, that we would be devoted to Christ and serve with integrity and imagination and devotion to you. And we give you thanks that we have these models to work from in the past so that we can do what you call us to do in the present. And for all of that, we give you thanks in the name of Jesus. Amen.